Web scrapers can be super useful for doing things like data collection, or maybe you're trying to look up the price of a product on a particular website. But ethical use cases aside, it's often challenging to try to figure out, first of all, where are you going to deploy that reliably so it's not just working only on your machine? And how can you do things like make sure, making sure that JavaScript is going to render? So you're not just getting back that first HTML response, you're actually seeing everything that's on the page. So let's see how we can use tools like Puppeteer, where we're going to load that up inside of a serverless function using Next.js, and we're going to see how we can deploy that out to Vercel. Now, if you've been following along with me for a minute, you might have seen my video in the past where we did a similar thing where we were automating Chrome inside of a serverless function. But part of the trick there were the dependencies were a little bit too big for a serverless function. We use tools like Chrome AWS Lambda and Puppeteer Core, which we're going to still kind of use similar things today, but dependencies change, the node versions increase, and it made it a little bit more difficult to try to run with all those same dependencies. So we have a little bit of a new approach where I found this article by Stefan Judas, which shows exactly what dependencies you need. Particularly, we're going to be replacing Chrome AWS Lambda with another fork of that package. Now, it's not just as simple as replacing the dependency, even though that's going to be part of the solution, but we'll see how we actually walk through and figure this out bit by bit. Now, to do this, we're going to use Next.js, where we're going to create an API route inside the app router. But why Next.js? Well, for me, it's just simple for me to spin up a quick environment. For you, you're probably already working out inside of your own application, whether that's Next.js, Astro, or something else. So this is really going to be able to transfer to probably most serverless environments, but this is just an easy way for me to get up and running. Hey you, yeah, come closer. If you want to learn how to build full stack Next.js 15 apps complete with authentication, database management, and payments, make sure to sign up to get exclusive access and updates to my upcoming course below. So I created this really simple starter that I'll link to in the description, where really all this is is a little bit of text and a button, which is going to simply allow me to make that request from the UI. Now we're going to see how we can create that API endpoint and then trigger it from within the app. So heading inside of the code, if I head over to my source directory inside of the app directory, I have my page.tsx. We can see I already opted in to use client just simply because this is just a demo for seeing how I can make that button click. I'm not going to try to over optimize here, but we can see that I have my handle on click and whenever I hit that button, it's going to invoke. So now let's start to set up that API endpoint. And to do that, I'm going to head over to the app directory. I'm going to create a new folder called API. Inside, I'm going to create a new folder called scraper or really whatever you want to call it. And then inside that, finally, I'm going to create my route.ts, which is going to be where I save all the code or add the code rather for my API route. So I'm going to first start by exporting a new async function, and I'm going to make that a post endpoint where inside, let's just start off by returning a simple response. So I'm going to return a response.json and we can say test equals true. Now to actually invoke that back inside of page.tsx, I'm going to say my const results is equal to await fetch, where I'm going to hit that API slash scraper, because that's the path that I set out for that route. And inside, I'm going to pass in that second option where I can pass my method as post. And then for now, I don't really have a body, but we can just start to pass in a json.stringify with an empty object, just so that we can set that up for when we do. Now I'm also going to chain a then where I'm going to to turn that into JSON. And then finally, I'm going to set my results instead of that test object to the actual results. So if I head to the browser and actually try to test that out, click get started, we can see that I get back that response. If we actually want to head over to the network tab and see how that's working out, we can click get started with that open. We can see that post to the scraper endpoint where then ultimately we get that test equals true. So now that we created our basic endpoint, let's actually start to set up our puppeteer instance. Now, if we head over to that package's GitHub page, we can see the installation instructions. And this is where it starts to get it a little bit tricky, where Puppeteer specifically ships with preferred versions of Chromium. And we need to make sure that our Puppeteer core package is actually going to match to our Chromium version. So if I head back over to my terminal and I'm going to npm install Puppeteer core, we're going to be able to see what version actually gets installed here. Where if I open up my package.json, we can see Puppeteer Core, and looks like our version is currently at 22.15.0. Now back to the installation instructions, and the link to this package is going to be inside the description. We can see we can go to Puppeteer's Chromium support page, where if we scroll down to supported browsers, we can find that 22.15 ver uh, version of Puppeteer, and we can match it to that Chrome version. So now as it states in the instructions in that example here, we can see that if Puppeteer's support page shows 1.06 point whatever, we would need to install the Chromium package of Chromium at 106. So because ours is 127, we can install at Spartacus Chromium at 127. 
Now, we ran into a little bit of an issue with that, though, is if we head over to npm.js, we can see that the latest version that was actually published for this package is 126. So we can't quite use the latest and greatest. If we head back over to the latest 126, we can see that that's going to be Puppeteer 22.13.1. So let's actually try to install that one so that we can get to the latest that we have available. So in my terminal, I'm going to npm install Puppeteer core at 22.13.1. And before I actually start to install this package, if we read a little bit further down, we can see that if your vendor does not allow large deploys, which ours is that case, 50 megabytes plus, we're going to need to use the min version of this. So we can see that right below it shows us this other option of the min package. So what we're going to do is we're going to install that min package, but we're going to install that one at 126, which is the latest that we have available to support. And just to confirm on that specific npm js page we can see that that also is the latest at 126. so i'm going to go ahead and npm install that package name at 126. then i'm going to start to import these dependencies so i'm going to import chromium from that package name i'm going to import puppet tier from puppet tier core now, in order to get this up and running, we're going to need to do a little bit of configuration for this. And rather than me trying to write that out all by hands, we can head down to this usage page and start to copy some of the stuff in. So I'm going to copy a lot of this in. I'm going to paste it right at the top of that post. However, I'm going to add some of this outside of the scope. I'm going to clean up some of these comments and I'm going to just skip through and clean the rest up. I can also get rid of this test case since we're not actually doing any testing. We're just trying to automate the browser here. I'm going to make sure that this is indented properly and get rid of the assertion. And once we're ready with that, I know ahead of time that this isn't going to work, but let's just see. So I'm going to go ahead and run npm run start to spin up my server. Make sure I refresh the page again so that we can get the new application. And if I hit get started again to make that request, we can see that we do get that 500 error. And if we preview that or rather look inside of the terminal, we can see if we get an error we can see that the Chrome executable path isn't actually resolving properly. Now, the problem is, is if we're trying to run this locally, we need to specify the local uh, path for our Chrome instance rather than it trying to actually use what, well, what's not our local version. Now to do this, if we look down at this executable path, what we're going to do is we're going to create an environment variable so that we can manually set this. And if it is set, we're going to use that. Otherwise, we're going to fall back to this executable path, which will work in the deployed environment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to head over to, or rather create my new .env file. I'm going to set up a Chrome executable path, which we'll get to in a second. Back inside of the browser, I'm going to create a constant is local equals if I have a process.env.executable path here, I'm going to add the bang bang here and we'll see why I'm using this in a second. But ultimately what we want to do with this initially is we want to pass it into this executable path property. So we're going to simply add it to the front and which is going to be truly or not. And we're going to say if that is available, use that otherwise or or we're going to use that await chromium executable path. Now, how do we get that executable path? Luckily, if you are using Chrome, we go to Chrome slash slash version where we can see, or wrong button, we can see our executable path, which we can go ahead and copy and then paste in as our environment variable. So now let's go ahead and try this again. So npm run dev, if I refresh the page, I'm gonna hit get started. And we can see that we at least got a 200 now. So now let's actually try to manipulate some of the page stuff so that we can see that it actually works. So I'm gonna update this to space jelly.dev. And we can see that we're getting the page title. So how about let's just first of all, return the page title. If I get started again, we can see that this time we do actually get an error. We get this error that's called navigating frame was detached. Now this is where that is local check is going to come in handy where I'm going to update the args and I'm going to go ahead and paste this in, but we're going to walk through it where we can see that what I'm going to do is if it is a local instance where I have my Chrome executable path set, we're going to go ahead and use the default args from Puppeteer itself. Otherwise, we're still going to use those Chromium args, but we're going to pass in a few additional ones, including hiding the scroll bars, incognito and no sandbox. But ultimately, we can see you'll be able to see this code inside of the source link that I have inside of the description. But now let's try this out with a different set of args. If I hit get started again, we can see that we do now get that page title. But the big question is, is this actually going to work deployed? So I went ahead and dumped this into GitHub. I'm going to go ahead and import that and deploy it. And now that I actually have this ready and deployed out, I can visit the page and let's go ahead and similarly try to hit that get started button. We can see that scraper post. 
And uh-oh, we actually do have a 500 here. Now, if we head back over to Vercel, I popped open the logs here, and we can see, if I stretch this over, we weren't able to find the browser at that executable path. Now, this is actually part of the design of that min package where it doesn't include those files because we're trying to keep it below that 50 megabytes. So what we need to actually do is we need to pass in a path or a self-hosted URL to that file so that we can make sure that we use that when we're trying to specify the executable path. Now, the nice thing is we can easily download that file that we need by heading back to the top under releases. We can find the release that we want. We can scroll down and we can download that file directly from GitHub where I can host that somewhere inexpensive like S3. And if I head back to my application where we see that executable path, we can pass in that URL as that executable path. So I'm gonna to try to push that change out and try it again. And this time when it's ready again, I can go ahead and reload my page. I can hit get started again to see if that post is going to work. And it didn't. And I just had a realization that the reason is because I checked in my .env file accidentally. Typically I use .env.local. It used to be, at least used to be the recommended path and it seems like that might change moving forward. But because I didn't name that .env local, that got checked in, pushed out, and Vercel was trying to actually find that and it was trying to load that path. The way I can see that is if I head over to my logs directory, we can see all the logs and we can see that exactly in here, it's not able to find that configured executable path, which is trying to look for that Mac OS Chrome, which is pointing to the fact that it's trying to look up that path. So we all know that these tutorials don't go perfectly every single time, but hopefully that helps with debugging. But now that we're actually pushing out removing that ENV and we're going to be supporting that URL instead. So this time when I tried to load the app and hit get started, we can see that it's going to take a few seconds, maybe too many seconds. This time it actually finished. We can see that it responded with my Space Jelly Web Dev website with the page title dynamically passed in. Now, another issue that I was alluding to is there's a timeout of 10 seconds for a Vercel function. So if it doesn't finish be uh, before that time, you're going to actually get a timeout. Now, we can see that that actually just happened here, and I was expecting it to happen that first time. Now, if we look at the Vercel documentation for this, we can actually configure this to go up to 60 seconds for hobby accounts and even higher if you have a paid account. Um, but the default for the hobby, the free account, is going to be that 10 seconds. So you got to make sure you configure that if what you're doing is with Puppeteer or whatever tools is going to be longer than that 10 seconds. But now that we actually have Puppeteer running locally, we have it running in our Vercel environment, we can really take advantage of any of the different APIs with Puppeteer so that we can do whatever kind of scraping we're looking inside of the page that we want. So for instance, that could be grabbing a screenshot of the page. So maybe I say const screenshot, let's set that equal to await page.screenshot. And while we're not gonna be able to actually see what that looks like quite yet, let's log that out so that we can see that in the browser or the terminal rather. So if I now run that locally, and I try to get started again. We can see that we get that page title. And if I look in the terminal, we can see that we get that buffer. It's buffer. So now that we can actually do something with that. For instance, if you've been following along, you've probably seen that I have some Cloudinary content. So one thing you can do is upload it to Cloudinary or AWS or really any kind of cloud storage. But if you want to try Cloudinary, for instance, you can npm install Cloudinary. And I'm just going to kind of breeze through this a little bit, but you can import the Cloudinary package v2 as Cloudinary. Then you can make sure you have your configuration with your cloud name, API key, and secret. Then I can actually upload that directly to Cloudinary where I can use the upload stream method. I can send that screenshot, the buffer of that. And then finally, that resource is going to be my Cloudinary upload. So I can just simply return that inside. And this time when I try to hit get started, and we got to wait a few seconds for that to actually perform. We can see that scraper request. We can see not only, that was pretty quick, we can see not only do I get that page title, but I also get that resource, which now if I try to open that up in the new tab, we can see that I have my screenshot of spacejelly.dev. Now, of course, because this is an API endpoint, we probably want to make this dynamic. So what we can do is we can set this up to pass in a body. So if I wanted to pass in my JSON and I say, how about site? URL is equal to HTTPS space jelly.dev. I can actually go into my route.ts file and on that request with uh, typed out as a request object, I can say, I want to grab my site URL and that's going to be equal to await request.json. I have that handy uh, JSON method attached. And instead of specifying space jelly.dev manually, I can pass that in as a variable. So now we can see if I click get started again, we can see that scraper request go off. We can see that that still brings back space jelly. But if I now change that to colbyfayok.com, I can refresh and try that again. 
And this time we can see that it returns that Colby Fayok page title. It returns that Cloudinary resource still, where let's just double check that this is going to be, yep, it's going to be the screenshot of ColbyFayok.com. So that worked perfectly. So again, a lot of this is configuration until you can actually get to the uh, puppeteer part where you can start playing around with it. So make sure you check out the link inside of the description to get the full code for exactly what you need to do. This is only scratching the surface. If you're ready to build a full stack Next.js 15 app, make sure you sign up below to get exclusive access and updates to my upcoming course. But speaking of API endpoints, what if I wanted to be able to hit this API route from a different application? Cords is probably gonna stop me. So let's find out how we can fix that.